So, welcome to our next session. We have here Ben Drücker from Camunda and his passion are workflows and uh, yeah, complex and distributed systems. So he will talk about that today as well. Uh, enjoy the talk. Thank you. Um, yeah, welcome. Um, I called the talk Lost in Transaction. It's obviously a bit about not getting lost in transaction. That's my idea. I want to talk about um, yeah, consistency in distributed systems. And I don't want to talk about like how to replicate data, like for example, in a geographically distributed Cassandra thingy, for example, that's not what I want to talk about. I want to more, more have a look at asset properties, for example, in certain systems. Um, who knows about domain-driven design? Just a quick raise of hands. Who has read the book? <laughs> OK, also a couple of people. That's pretty good. Um, I want to start with some, something from de domain-driven design which I think is very interesting. So if you design a domain, uh, let's say that's a very simple like order fulfillment system. I do a lot of order fulfillment examples because they are easy to understand. So let's as assume you have an order entity and probably the order has line items. And that's the wording um, you have in domain trim design. So an order and entity has an uh, identity. So you have a clear ID. You can ask, hey, give me the order. You cannot ask that for the order line item. That's a value object. That's just a like besides the order. Um, you might have uh, other entities as well, like a customer, and that probably has other value objects like an address. Okay? That's a typical scenario to be in. What DDD defines, and that's a very interesting concept, is actually a so-called aggregate. An aggregate um, basically groups them um, in a way we will explore further in the next slides. Okay? So an aggregate is kind of a boundary. It's kind of a, a bracket around certain things. So in our, th our case, we could have an order aggregate and probably a customer aggregate. That could make sense. I discuss that in a second. And the important thing is, between the aggregates, we are relatively loosely coupled. So there's not like a foreign key, for example, in a database. It's more like a reference by identity. It's a string. Right? The order knows the customer ID by string, but not by reference, for example. That's more or less how aggregates and entities and these kind of things work in DDD. And we could have more of these kind of aggregates. I actually added that for an argument's sake on the next slides. I even don't like the example too much, but um, you probably know own examples where you now have the requirement where you say, hey, I want to do two things which are probably rooted in different aggregates, like business logic, in an all or nothing semantics. And that's actually what I want to talk about today, right? Um, so how do I do that? For example, I create the charge and I want to mark the order as paid, as kind of a flag, right? And there, there are a couple of um, ways of approaching that, but today I want to talk basically about asset transactions. That could be the next question, like who knows what asset stands for? Um, which I think most of us do, um, but probably forget about that. So I walk you through it. A is for atomicity, that's the, like all or nothing. Right? So it's atomic. I do either everything or nothing of it. That's an important thing here. Um, it's about consistency. Consistency, it's very often confusing here. It's um, more or less about the database, for example, is always consistent to certain invariants, like non-null constraints, foreign keys, these kind of things. That's about um, the consistency property. I is about isolation, and that's actually the important property we want to focus on today. So that basically means if I have two different threats, looking at the same data, they see the data only in a consistent state. So they don't see in-between states, right? That's, you know that from the isolation levels from certain databases, like read committed and these kind of things. We will focus on that pretty much during the talk. And durable, I mean, that's what you should uh, yeah, have from a database. Whatever you do there, it's durable, it's saved, stored for later. And the important thing is, aggregates are consistency boundaries. So whenever... Um, you leave the aggregate, you don't have asset, property, uh, asset properties, yeah, asset transactions out of the box. Right? So you can do asset within one aggregate, so there you have transactions, because you probably rely on a relational database, which um, gives you asset um, for free. Um, but you cannot do joint asset transactions between aggregates. And that's an important, first of all, that's important to recognize. I think we're at the stage where people start to recognize. I mean that you're here probably is part of that you recognize that problem. Um, but a couple of years back, people didn't really recognize that. 
The second thing you can probably um, discuss here, oh, yeah, and the, the reason for that, I think I don't have to go into that on a microservice conference. I mean, it's about um, autonomy, it's about isolation. You probably want to want to choose different database products, and if it's still if it's the same database product, you have different instances of the database. So um, you really keep things isolated, right? That's the idea here. That's why you want to do that. And. The important thing to note is that it's not a God-given thing. You can design these boundaries as you want to, and this should probably be part of the thinking about finding the right boundaries, the right context, that you say, hey, in this case, it's much easier for me, like transaction-wise, to go for a design where we have all in one aggregate. That might be totally valid, right? So it's not just because we are doing microservices that's not allowed. I mean, that's a valid design. For me, the important part is to make a conscious decision about that. Because what I still see in a lot of systems is that um, you do joint database transactions on a joint database. You say, hey, I, I mean, technically I can do that. That's all one Oracle instance there. So I just like write everything in there. I can do a transaction. It's all Java or whatever, so it's easy to do. And that's actually um, what you shouldn't do. Then you have this dependency very implicit, right? So that's um, basically the bad practice here. That's kind of an intro so far. The next, and it, now it starts to get, be, uh, to get more interesting. The next thing you could think of is, hey, we are having these two boundaries here, to these two um, aggregates. Let's do um, two-phase commit or XA transaction or three-phase commit. Who knows uh, two-phase commit? Transaction protocols? Oh, a lot of people distribute transactions. Who uses that? Oh, none. Okay. Oh, one, half. Okay. Um, that's, that's actually a typical um, thing I see out there. So it's, it's very well known, but nobody really uses it. And I actually don't want to explain two-phase commit in detail here. It basically uses a transaction coordinator to coordinate things between different, like, for example, databases. <laughs> the thing with these kind of um, transaction managers is um, that they're quite complex, and they're in, in real-life projects didn't turn out to work very well. The best paper you can read about that is from Pat Held. Pat Held is a really one of the guys in distributed systems. At that time, he worked at Amazon. Now he's at Salesforce. He did a couple of other stations at um, and big companies there. And he writes really good papers, so it's fun to read. It's not like too much scientific there. It's, it's really fun to read. So if you go through it, you basically will discover there are basically two problems with uh, distributed transaction managers. The first is it's just um, it doesn't scale. So it's normally a bottleneck, there's no deadlock uh, detection. So if you build a considerably big system, that will be quite a bottleneck. So you will get a, quite a problems with a transaction manager. The second thing is, it's simply too complicated to work. Most people don't understand it. There are reasons, uh, there, there are situations where it can get stuck and nobody understands that. You have to resolve that manually as an operator and it's not easy to operate these systems and nobody understands that. So um, overall, I wouldn't bet on um, transaction managers like distributed transactions, right? So in my world, normally um, they don't exist. I, I, I would never recommend using um, XA like in as of 2018. There are interesting things going on around like Google Spanner and these kind of things, but there are ed edge cases, I would say. So um, don't consider two-phase commit to be available. A good um, metaphor for um, really thinking about that is um, from Gregor Hopi. You probably know Gregor from um, this Enterprise Integration Patterns book. Right? And he wrote, and that's quite a while back, from 2008 or something like that, or probably even older, um, he wrote about Starbucks doesn't use two-phase commit. And that's a good metaphor to keep that in mind. So if you go to a local bakery like here in Berlin, go around the corner, go in there, and you order coffee, like what happens? I mean, the person behind the, um, the, behind the counter is basically blocked exclusively for you. He gets the money, he turns around, or she, and makes the coffee, gets it to you. And he's blocked until you have the coffee. If you order like 10 coffees and you have a queue behind you, everybody will hate you because that like really takes a long time. And Starbucks works completely different. You, you pay at the counter, um, then you're done. The resource at the counter is freed, right? You have to give them your name because that's a correlation ID they need later on, and then you're put in a queue, and then the barista, it's scaled autonomously, right? And it makes the coffee, and at the very end, you wait for the coffee and you get it back. It scales much better, 
It's a much better behavior for, for these kind of systems. And that's a good metaphor to keep in mind, right? So we don't want to use that two-phase commit metaphor. If you look back, actually, and you read about distributed systems, you will find a lot of um, information about that. I like this slide, actually. It's from um, Eric Brewer. He's one of the Google guys. And he did that in, in the year 2000 already. So it's a quite old slide. Um, but he said, hey, um, if we want to have performant and distributed systems, we have to forfeit C and A, and he refers to the consistency and the isolation property of ACID. And this is fundamental to build really distributed and scalable systems. And that's 2000. That's quite old. I mean, the, the interesting part is it now comes back. Now people start to understand, which is, which is kind of good, but it's, it's not a new thing, actually. And he um, named that base basically available soft state eventual consistency. That's one of the sources where eventual consistency as a term um, was also coined very much. Um, it, the acronym never really took off too much, um, but that's one of the roots where, where people really thought about architectures doing it differently. And what it basically means, if you do A and B in, um, in an all or nothing semantics, it's not completely acid. Right? It's locally asset, so A does something in an asset way because there you're having a local service. You probably have a transaction on a database. Um, depends on the system you use, but there is at least the possibility to use asset. Right? And then you have the two um, uh, services, both asset, but in between you have a temporal inconsistent state. Right? Um, because some, some other service could come along and, and, and read some data from A at this point in time, um, because that's already committed, this is not yet done, so you have no idea if that will happen like later on. I'll make an example in a second. And that, funny enough, it doesn't violate the consistency property of assets, the isolation um, property of asset. Okay? So that's the situation we're in. Also, a fun part of that story is that very often, if you're talking about transactions, when I discuss that with business folks, always the same example comes up like, hey, money transfer. That's kind of the prototype of a business transaction. And the interesting part is, if you look at money transfer, if you do that not, like nowadays, and you're not using something like PayPal or like a real bank account, it's kind of transactional, yes, in a business sense. But I mean, if I, if I um, just like um, uh, do the money transfer now, the money is gone from my account, but it's not yet there. It's there, like it's gone for a day. Or, or probably even longer, you have no idea where the money is in the between, but what they make sure at the very end, it's consistent. So either you get the money back or it's booked on the other account, right? So business transactions don't rely on technical transactions. And that's a discussion I have very, very often, either with business folks who are not used to this kind of thinking, but also with technical people, like, for example, insurances having the big, like, COBOL stuff in, down there in the cellar, and they're still like, hey, we do everything transactional. It's possible on the host. Why can't you do that with microservices? And it's kind of the, I think, the wrong thinking. So a business transaction don't need to be backed by a technical transaction, because if you think back of pet held, it just doesn't scale, right? OK, that's kind of setting the scene. I'm talking of pet held, he has a couple of other papers. One is building on quicksand, which is also part of DynamoDB. And um, there he coined another term for that. He said, we have to build um, applications that are ACID 2.0 which is kind of, at that time, 2.0 was kind of new, fresh, right? <laughs> uh, today it would be probably different, but it was a good acronym. And he said, applications have to be associative, communicative, idempotent, distributed. What does that mean? Um, I don't really go into associative and communicative today, but it basically means if you have a message-driven system, um, you shouldn't rely too much on the order of the messages. Like, if they can be out of order, and you can work with that, or you can detect that probably, um, you build a much more robust system. Okay? So you shouldn't rely on the order too much. It might change a bit nowadays with these kind of event logs and, and things like Kafka, which can at least guarantee order for local things. But overall, that's a good design decision. If you can get rid of the um, need for ordering, um, that's a good thing. I want to focus on the other two more, actually, today. So the other one is. Um, your systems have to be, or your services have to be idempotent. So that means if I call it twice, it doesn't harm, whatever that means. Either I detect it, or at least it doesn't matter. I can be called twice without anything um, being really, really broken. 
And that's because we are building distributed systems. And I make an example for that. Um, I always use that metaphor for distributed systems. Um, the, I learned that from Jonas Bonnet, actually, the guy behind um, Lightband and Akka and these kind of things. And I like it, actually. So um, your one microservice is that probably that small hut over there. There you have asset transactions. You're having one programming language. You have an idea what your threats are doing. So it's kind of a cozy world to do stuff in there. But whenever you open the door, then you face that rough ocean. And the rough ocean, that's the network. And the network is working with probabilities. It's probably there, probably not. I mean, it's kind of, kind of a game where, where you see what ha what's happening when you do it. So it's not deterministic at all. And you have to deal with that. And basically, every developer in a distributed system has to be aware of that fact. And that's what's currently happening. I liked actually how um, InfoQ did that in the la la latest um, architecture. Um, how's that called? The um, Jan, how's that called? <laughs> the architecture review thing where you do it on the hype cycle. Um, on the hype cycle, adopting microservices like in the late maturity, everybody's doing it, but building proper distributed systems is in the early maturity. So we are starting to understand how to build systems. And that's the important thing. It's a distributed system here. And there are policies. I like the policies of distributed um, computing from Peter Deutsch. The first is the network is reliable. So it's not reliable. That's what I said. It's about determinist uh, probabilities. OK, so let's look at an example. Let's make a very easy example, again, in the uh, context of order fulfillment. Let's say uh, we want to collect money for some order. Then we might um, want to do a payment service, a payment microservice, for example. And that uses a credit card service, probably via REST API, right? Easy to understand, I guess. OK. If I do that, I can always get network exceptions, right? I mean, that's a remote call. Let's, let's say it's REST, so it, it can always be not available. Then I get an exception. What I normally do um, as a strategy there is kind of a retry, right? Because I don't just want to like, re-throw the arrow to my client because um, just a credit card service has a network hiccup. That would be bad behavior because then I distribute that failure to all the other services consuming payment. So I want to handle it locally. I probably do a retry. The first thing to mention here, it has to be idempotent in order to um, be able to do retries. If you're, by the way, if you're using messages um, instead of REST, there's no way to get around it. With messages, you probably have retries. It's, it's kind of built in. You should always think about, I probably have a retry, right? So this has to be idempotent. That can be very easy. I mean, um, you just have to think about how to add something in the interface to make it idempotent. So in our case, it could be kind of a transaction ID, for example. And that's generated by the client. And if you look at overall like bigger architectures, there's a big trend towards generating IDs like as soon as possible. Like, for example, you could generate an order ID already th during checkout when you don't yet know if there will ever be an order, but you can already generate the idea, and then you can pass it around, and that makes item potency life much easier for everybody. So these are the kind of things you should have in mind whenever building a distributed system. Um, yeah, that's my favorite slide. Mm. I give it a second to uh, sink in. Um, no, there's a small story behind that. So, um, like, f I don't remember exactly, five years, six years back, um, I had a vegan part in my life. So I ate vegan for five months, six months. At that time, I didn't have kids, so it worked out pretty well. Um, now that's not possible anymore. But that's my favorite dish. There was a zucchini dish where you um, slice the zucchini. There's a special slicer. Then you get noodles out of the zucchini. You add some sauce, and that's fantastic. Um, there's, in the cookbook, they say you can eat as much as you want from that because it's basically it's not unhealthy, you don't grow fat, so you can really eat as much as you, uh, as you want. And since then, uh, actually, or since I uh, thought about that a bit more, I use that as a met metaphor for item potency, because if you forgot if you already ate your plate of zucchini, you can just eat another one, or you can eat another one, or another one, right? So it's totally item potent to eat zucchini. Um, it's different with pasta. And, um, <laughs> I know, it's a kind of a silly metaphor, but um, what's important, if you have a better idea, by the way, let me know. I'm collecting these. I have a couple of other proposals by now, but they're, I think, even more silly, so I um, didn't get a really good one. If you have a good one, let me know. Um, but the important thing is to keep it in mind. Item potency is one of the key 
from my perspective, one of the key factors to be successful in this kind of um, world. Anyhow, um, going back to distributed systems, there's another um, yeah, characteristic of this kind of network communication, which is even worse. Um, whenever you do a REST call, think of the REST call, and you get a network exception, right? You have no idea which of these three failure scenarios just happened. So either you never reach the service provider, and just the network was not available. You probably has, have reached the service provider, but it exploded during doing your request. You have no idea if he committed the transaction or not. Or probably he did everything perfectly, returned the response, and the response got lost in the network. You have no idea to differentiate between these. You have no idea what happened. So whenever you do a REST call and you get an exception, you have no idea, right? At least for network exceptions. The same thing if you do messaging. You send us a message and you wait for the response, but you don't get any. What happened? You, know, you don't know. And you can't know, that's the important thing. There's no way of knowing that. Um, so you have to at least think about these kind of issues, and that's a consistency problem. So if, for example, I um, want to charge the credit card, and at some point I give up, I say, hey, that just doesn't work. I probably have charged the credit card, technically, right? So I have to think about that, and especially in payment, it's probably ignorance is not the best strategy to do that. Um, there are use cases where just ignoring it is a good strategy, but then make a conscious decision about that. And a lot of people just don't think about that. That's what I see out there for a lot of developers. Just don't realize um, that you have to think about that. Um, in this case, I probably have to make sure it's not charged, either by checking if it was charged, either by issuing a refund, by issuing a cancellation. It depends on the interface, um, but I have to think about that. Right. Um, and right, because we're in these kind of distributed systems, um, some of these patterns, when you want to implement that, like the cancellation, for example, here, I mean, if the service was not available when I called it, it's probably also not available when I want to make sure it wasn't called, right? So th some of these things are really requirements, some, require some kind of state handling. And that's actually my take on the topic. And, um, we want to quickly look into how that looks like if I do, for example, a stateful retry. That's not the much important thing, but this stateful cancellation. Um, I want to make my, let's say, my personal bias transparent here. So um, what's my background that you know from how I um, look at certain topics? Um, I'm co-founder of Kamunda. We're an open source workflow engine um, vendor. We're quite... Um, yeah, I have quite, quite a lot of customers out there. I do that basically since more or less 15 years, 10 to 15 years. I've work, worked with different open source workflow engines in the past, right? And there on the left, you mostly find me there with a the coffee in the early trains. That's what I um, normally do. And um, really going out to customers, learn what they do with it. But that, on the other hand, means that to a lot of problems, I'm looking from the perspective of a state machine, of a workflow engine, right? So that's kind of, let's say, I, I like that perspective, but it's probably also my bias. I want to want to make it transparent to you guys. So, and from that perspective, for me, it's very natural to for certain of these kind of um, problems using a state machine for that. And what I use here is um, BPMN. That's an ISO standard. I show that in a second, where you can describe certain state machines easily, right? So, for example, I could leverage that in order to do the stateful retrying. And with stateful, I mean, hey, do it for for a longer time, like hours if it takes so long in order for the other service to get up, right? But the more important thing normally also something like where I say, hey, in order, if the charge didn't work and I give up, I probably issue an uh, event immediately, hey, it couldn't, couldn't um, retrieve payment, like cancel the order, go on. So nobody has to wait for me, but then I make sure I clean up. And that can be persistent, and that can take a long time if I want to, because I have the state machine. And I use that as a basis for a couple of advanced patterns, which I want to look into um, right in a minute. That's why I thought I um, make the example also like available in code, that you get an idea of what I'm talking about. So what I will show you in a second is that exactly that example. For me, by the way, that's domain logic. Right? I will talk about DSLs and graphical programming at the very end, 
briefly. Um, but that's the main logic. And that's actually also very interesting to, um, to currently um, observe in different customers, so, uh, with different customers. So um, even if that's a very technical problem that the, like the REST call might not go through because of a network, the reaction to that is it's business logic. And we have to discuss that with business folks. Like, what should I do? Can I just give up? Can I ignore it? Do I have to refund? What do I have to do? There are a lot of like, the, like di discussions like these currently going on in the project, right? Um, so um, this is definitely business logic, and we have to get used to these kind of things. And then I use like a workflow engine in order to, to um, have the stateful things um, just executed um, there. And that's, by the way, if you're in DDD, that's kind of the hexagonal architecture they propose there. So that's kind of the thing. And today I want to, um, by coincidence, um, it's an open source workflow engine from us, but you can, in your head, you can replace that with other frameworks which work like that. I just wanted to do a quick, very, very quick um, dive into the code that you get an idea what I'm talking about, because a lot of people are, are still in a mood when I say workflow engine, they think of, wow, that's a kind of a complex thing. I have to, whatever, run certain weird things in order to get going. And that's just not true anymore. There are a couple of tools I talk about that at the very end, um, which can do these kind of things. Um, today, I, I, I chose for a Java example. I'm not sure if that was a good decision. Who is programming in Java? OK, that's half of the people, so it's at least not a really bad decision. Um, who's doing Node, JS stuff, JavaScript, C Sharp? OK. So Java seemed to be a valid choice for today. So that's a Java example. Um, and yes, it's Eclipse, um, which I'm using here. Um, <laughs> so um, what I did is I, I, I just provide a REST API, right? Um, in order to retrieve payment, very easy. It does a couple of things which don't matter for here, like, like random data and these kind of things. Um, but what it actually should do, it should charge my credit card. That's the business logic it should do. And in order to do that, that's what I mean. I can use a workflow engine in order to back that with a state. And for Kamuna, for example, it works like that. I add a Spring Boot starter I'm here in Spring Boot. So I have the workflow engine as a library in the service. So it's very lightweight. It just leverages a data source underneath. Um, it's auto-wired. I can create a flow, um, like a workflow in BPMN. I could do that graphically, but I normally start with a code because that's the same thing. A lot of people are afraid of graphical models, like, whoa, there's magic behind. And that's also not true. I mean, for me, Graphics are very valuable, but if you want to, you can start with the code. So it's just an uh, executable process. It starts at the very beginning. There is um, one so-called service task in BPMN. Um, that means I do logic. And logic, because I'm in Spring Boot here, it's a Spring Bean. And the logic is just defined here. It's not a best practice to have that in the same class, but whatever. Um, it's a Spring Bean, right? Um, and what happens later on, if a workflow instance is created and runs through that activity, it will execute that code here, right? Um, and that's now, again, normal Java code. In this case, I use the REST template here in order to do um, the credit card call, like the REST call. And I used, for example, Hystrix in order to have a um, um, circuit breaker here, right? So it's normal developer's code, but I can attach that to a workflow engine in order to, for example, do things like this, um, failed job retry, where I say, hey, retry it for three times with a delay of period time 10 seconds. But I could also wait for minutes or hours or whatever, right? And I can define what happens in, in kind of the arrow if there are no retries left. So that's exactly what I had on the picture. I go another way where I say, hey, I want to cancel Stripe. It's again, it's a spring beat. So it's relatively straightforward. And now what I can do, I can deploy that to the engine. That's more or less it, right? So that's basically the definition. Then I deploy that to my workflow engine, gets versioned and these kind of things. And then when I charge it, like do the business logic, I'm not calling it right away, but I'm starting a workflow instance in um, the workflow engine and pass on some data, right, which are persistent there as part of it. Um, right. So as soon as I do that, and what I have, I, I have that running here in the background, and I have a so-called, I called it Stripe fake server. So I can do REST requests here in order to charge uh, a, a credit card. Uh -huh. um, and I can do REST requests here. Um, so what I do is I call this service I just showed you, and this one called the Stripe fake. And if I do that, um, that should work um, more or less out of the box. I probably, yeah, I go to another version in a second. Um, but what 
could happen. I mean, everything is working at the moment, so you saw that I did a charge here. Um, I can simulate network problems, so I can um, change that um, service to behave slow. What it does is basically simulates a slow network connection, which is the more common thing you <laughs> will probably have. Now, my circuit breaker should recognize that and should actually cut the, cut the connection, and I should get an exception here. So let's look at that. So what you can see is basically exactly that. It takes long, 17 seconds. Well, sorry. Um, you see the circuit breaker exception here, right? So there's an exception definitely in the other service. Um, you see, and that's actually interesting. I'm not talking about that today. I have an on talk on that. Um, 202 accepted here. So that's kind of, OK, I switched to asynchronous because it's not possible, which is a good kind of thinking, but I'm not talking about that today. Um, and then you normally have these kind of um, like uh, possibilities to observe what's going on. So for example, I could now look at, hey, what's going on with my payment? Oh, it's not there. Why not? Um, OK, it already timed out in the past. So that should be um, the instance we're looking at, right? And then you can do a lot of fancy stuff, like also like showing the history and this kind of thing. So that's basically, I use that in order to visualize what a state machine is. So it keeps the things persistent, and it wait for, waits for certain things. And by the way, it doesn't have to be asynchronous. So if you fancy, and that's a good design, I think, if you fancy um, a behavior where you want to be synchronous, um, I would do something like this. Hey, 202 accepted, because not everything is working right now, right? Some parts of the system are broken. And as soon as everything is well, back to normal, um, I can also go back to a 200 OK, right? So now I have one instance which basically just went through. OK, but I'm not going into more details here, because for me, that was just the, to give you an idea what I mean by state machine, because now we're looking into that. If you want to dive into more details of that, there's a blog post where I look at that, also for different languages, if you're in C Sharp or Node.js or others. One thing, and that um, surprised me, actually, but I saw that a couple of times already. And the last time I saw it for a big um, uh, uh, SaaS uh, uh, CRM system, a cloud CRM system, basically. And they had Rabbit, RabbitMQ for messaging. And what they did is, and whenever there was a message, they consumed it in some, um, let's say, business service, which was written in Go, but that's, I mean, could be any language. But what they did is they received the message, right, from Rabbit. They did some business logic involving some database. The next thing they wanted to do are two things. The first is they wanted to send a response, and that should be, that was one requirement, as fast as possible, in order to... Um, um, yeah, because there was basically somebody waiting at the other end. And they wanted to send out additional events, like in kind of an event-driven architecture. And this should, for example, not delay the response, waiting for sending the events. But the requirement was, hey, we want to have that in an all-or-nothing semantics, right? So we want to have that in kind of a transactional semantic. And what they did um, was kind of amazing and crazy at the same time. Um, so they, they used Debezium. I'm not sure if anybody knows Debezium. It's basically a tool to replicate databases like to a, to a other geo location, reading the database transac transaction log. And they used that in order to basically hook up with the database transaction log in order to generate um, these stuff from the transaction log later on, because then they could commit this Right, that was done, and then they were sure that these were done later on. And they had to do that in each and every service. That was kind of a really complicated thing, actually. Um, what we ended up with there was a relatively simple workflow. I mean, this is, again, it's a, it's a consistency problem here, where you say, hey, I want to receive the message. That's the first step. Then I'm kind of committed. And then I make sure that I progress later on. It might not be immediately, because probably that database is down, right? That's again about the eventual consistency. We are not fully isolated, but we make sure we run through the whole workflow at some point in time, eventually, right? So there are very simple um, problems where you can apply these kind of things. And I'm not talking about that today, but if you, if you fancy it, ask me later on. Um, Yes, you can also run that at a big scale. So also, that's another conception where a lot of people think, hey, workflow engine, you, can, you cannot run our whatever 30K, 100K, 200K instances per second, like REST requests. You cannot do that. And yes, it's possible by now. Um, but if you're interested in that, ask me later on. I want to focus on the content today. So um, back to that awesome book. 
I totally recommend to read that book. Um, it was released last year. It was written by Martin Kleppmann. You probably know him. If you don't know him, go on YouTube, watch a talk. He does amazing talks. And he wrote about data, uh, designing data-intensive applications here. And he gave a talk at Strange Loop. So um, I totally sto stole uh, one slide from him from that Strange Loop talk. That's on YouTube, so you can definitely look it up. And he said, hey, without cross-service transactions, right? So without the XA, the two-phase commit, what we said early on, you have two possibilities, basically. So you either do compensating transactions, which is kind of a rollback on the business level, or you do apologies. And apologies, I don't go into that today, um, but it's an interesting concept, actually, to keep in mind. You don't always have to make sure um, you don't violate a constraint. You have to make sure to recognize it. And probably just apologizing is a good way of dealing with that. It's kind of, he makes the example, when you order at Amazon and basically you have the, hey, it's on stock, we can deliver it like right away to you. And then you order it and then they can't. It's kind of, oh, sorry, we had a wrong amount in, in our database, we send you a voucher or whatever, right? It could be a valid strategy. But about, I want to talk about compensating transactions here. And there's one classical example which everybody uses in the industry for, for this kind of pattern. So I use that as well. Business-wise, it's probably not what most of you are doing. But it's about booking a trip. I want to go on a, on a business trip and I need a hotel, I need a car, I need a flight. And this probably calls out like different like, services in the internet. And that means I don't have a transactional asset boundary. I cannot just use a transaction manager for that. If somebody happens in, for example, when I book the flight, um, I need to make sure um, to get in a consistent state, which probably means canceling the car and canceling the hotel. I know it's not the best business example, and there, there are lots of reasons why I probably don't want to do that, but try to get on another flight or something like that. But that's, again, it's a business decision. But it's easy to understand, right? So this um, is the idea of compensation. It means I don't really roll back that on a technical level, but I have an undo functionality, which really undoes it on a business level, right? It might cost money, by the way. I might need to pay cancellation fees, but I make sure it's consistent again. And this is very often known as the uh, Saga pattern. So if you Google for that, um, you might find it for, uh, like, um, named as the uh, Saga pattern. Good. And there are two ways of um, implementing that. And I want to go into a bit of detail for that because it's kind of a proxy discussion which is going on for microservices anyway. So do I want to use that choreographed? or orchestrated. And I want to make one example which um, uses an event-driven choreography for the sake of the argument here. So I could say, hey, there's a trip service which gets a request to book a trip. That means he could probably issue an event trip requested, which, by the way, is not a real event from my perspective. It's kind of a command in disguise, but that's a different discussion as well. So it says probably trip requested, and the hotel says, oh, if there was a trip requested, I have to book the hotel, and emits another event, hey, the hotel was booked, so the car or the rental car service knows, hey, I um, need to book a car, the car is booked, the flight, um, and so on and so forth, right? It's kind of an event chain. That's what I, what I see in a lot of choreographed and event-driven systems. If there was an error, like I couldn't book the flight, um, I basically go back that chain, right? So there was probably an event like the flight booking was failed, so the car has to listen for that, the car, rental car service. Oh, then I have to undo what I did earlier on, which basically means canceling the car, um, probably emit another event, the hotel undoes whatever it needs to undo, um, and so on and so forth. Make sense? Yeah, okay. That's the choreographed approach. Um, right, the, the, the thing is, um, with that approach, I, I very, uh, for a long time I had kind of, let's say, a bad gut feeling. I, for me, it looked kind of weird, this kind of like really flow of events which I cannot really see in the system, which is kind of emerging behavior which just like is pulled out of the air. So I always had a bad feeling. Um, very often when I discussed that, it was kind of, yeah, but you're the orchestration guy, you're the workflow guy, your tool is not on that slide, so you obviously don't like it. Um, and I, I personally was really happy when this blog post came out, um, beginning of 2017 already. And Martin Fowler, as probably most of you know Martin Fowler, I guess, yes, I see a lot of people nodding. Um, so he also termed that 
um, smart endpoints dump pipes principle in microservices. And he wrote, hey, the danger is that it's very easy to make nicely decoupled systems with event notification, right? That's why we're doing it, without realizing that you're losing sight of a larger scale flow and thus set yourself up for trouble in future years, right? So there is also risk involved. And if you search for that, um, you find more and more evidence of that as well. So, um, for example, Dennis wrote uh, a while back, if your transaction involves two to four steps, choreography might still be a good fit. But if, if you have more, it gets rapidly confusing. It's difficult to track. Um, you might add cyclic dependencies. So there are a couple of downsides as well. You should at least make, again, a conscious decision to, to go into um, take these risks if you want to go there, down the choreography route. Um, you can make a very easy example by, for example, changing the sequence here. So let's assume um, that normally, I mean, ah, that's also good um, advice, by the way. Um, these kind of sagas are very often ordered by risk. So canceling the hotel is at least expensive. Canceling the flight is the most expensive. So that's why we have that order. That's a, also a design decision. But now we could say, hey, we have a, whatever, a good deal with a car rental agency and they, we can cancel for free. So we want to do that before we book the hotel. If you want to do that change here in that sequence, um, I don't want to make the full exercise, but you have to change each and every service. To have that make to make that happen, and it's not only that you have to change them and redeploy them. You also have to think about ongoing trip bookings currently circulating through the system. So it's not an easy thing to do, right? Um, again, it depends on the number of services and how they communicate. Um, from what I saw, and that's probably my personal again my biased view, but. Um, I, I very often see that picture when, when in talks would advertise kind of choreographies. It's kind of a beautiful dance, right? A lot of professional dancers. And you can just add another dancer and he knows what he has to do, so it looks just beautiful. You add him, you don't need a central conductor doing anything. Um, but in the products I see, and I saw a lot of them actually over the last years, um, it, it felt really different. Um, I mean, it's sometimes it's hard to keep an overview, sometimes hard to keep track of what's going on, sometimes hard to change, hard to manage, and these kind of things. Um, so it, it has to be a balance. What's the different, uh, the alternative? The alternative is orchestration, and orchestration in this case would look like this. We have the trip service, it gets a request, and then it's not an event chain, but it's more like the trip service says, hey, hotel service, please book a hotel for me. That's a command. I, I just really want the hotel service to do something for me and wait until he's done. And then the next thing is, hey, car rental, please book a car for me, and then the flight, right? So we have that one point where we control the sequence. Um, and that, in this case, I think in this example, makes a lot of sense, at least for me, but that it depends always a bit on the use case. If you want to change something, you have exactly like one point where you can change things. I think that's one of the big advantages you have here. Good. Um, and now, if you're coming back to, to state machines, you can describe these kind of orchestrations with BPMN. So the example I just showed you would look like this. Hey, I want to reserve the car, and then I directly define the compensating, the undo activity with it. And the workflow engine keeps track of if I already executed it, and if later on um, I, I have to roll back, it automatically um, executes the undo functionality again stateful, and these kind of things. Okay, so there are a lot of things um, which you um, can do. And that would be kind of the Saga pattern implemented with the BPMN engine, which I personally like as a um, pattern. And another observation you often have, when, when, when I say workflow engine, a lot of people think of some central, whatever, probably complex proprietary piece of software. And that's just not true. I mean, if you look at it, I had the workflow as part of the domain logic. I had the workflow engine probably as library in one service, so it's nothing central. It's really just um, part of one service of its API, but it probably orchestrates others. And that, for me, makes, makes a lot of sense. If you want to know more about Saga, another talk I can totally recommend on YouTube is from Katie McCathy. At that time, she worked at Twitter, and she wrote a, a couple of papers uh, around distributed um, transactions with the Saga pattern. And I think, from, from my perspective, this is one of the best talks to go through that. She does the same example, by the way. One more or less last thing on graphical modeling. So um, 
what I, I normally always have that discussion, like, oh, ooh, BPMN, and this is like oh, graphical programming, I hate that, I don't want to do that. And what I normally like showing up, especially if we are having the example at hand now, um, there's a great blog post from Clemens Fasters, uh, um, he works at um, Microsoft, and it's not, nothing against Clemens, Clemens is a great guy, he does good work, he does good blog posts, um, and he wrote that one on Sagas. He does the same business example we just saw, right? And the interesting part is he describes basically his implementation of the Saga pattern, right, all over the place. But he starts with a picture, of course, because otherwise you don't understand what he describes there. So I think these kind of visuals are really important um, to understand this kind of business logic, especially because a lot of what I said earlier, a lot of the reactions on these kind of technical problems you have to discuss with business people. Right. Um, and this one is, I mean, he works at Microsoft, it's probably PowerPoint. It's outdated the moment you have it on the block. Yeah. Um, right, that's BPMN. And you can awesome stuff. I mean, it's executable code, it's living documentation. Um, you can do a, lots of good stuff. Also, in operations, you can discuss with different stakeholders. So um, it's pretty cool. And if you still don't want to model graphically, I don't ha totally understand sometimes why. You can also do a, uh, a DSL. So I also I have everything I showed today on GitHub, so you can also see that on GitHub. You can build your own DSL. It's relatively easy to do. So if you really prefer that, just do it. Um, last thing, um, probably two minutes left, and then we go into a quick question round. Um, the state machine market, if you think about now going down that route, what you will see is that it's not that easy at the moment. There are a lot of tools and a lot of frameworks out there. I try to classify that a bit, actually. So um, there are, for example, these um, pure play BPMS. That's kind of what I normally call the BPM from the past. So that's probably all the vendors you probably try to avoid better. Then what you can see is that there are a lot of things going on at the, let's say, um, uh, yeah, the, the Silicon Valley stacks, like Uber did something with Uber Cadence, Netflix did something with Netflix Conductor, Airbnb did Apache Airflow, ING did ING Baker, so there are a lot of like open source workflow engines emerging from these kind of companies. Um, interesting to look at, I mean, it definitely proves the requirement for it. Um, very often they're very opinionated to, to live in their world, obviously. Then there are a lot of open source workflow engines, that's where we are basically, like the open source ones, but there are others as well, which might probably be worth to look at. Um, I don't think so, but um, you probably do. Um, then there are cloud offerings. Every cloud vendor does something. That's also interesting. Step functions, Azure, durable functions, GCP, um, Cloud Composer, so all the cloud vendors are doing something. And then sometimes also people mix it up with other frameworks like Camel or Ballerina or Apache Airflow. Um, very often you have to look at, like, what do you need? And normally I use these questions for, do I need Stateful? Um, like Camel, for example, is not stateful. Um, do I, does it support the flow logic I need, like for example, for compensation? Does it support what I call BIS DevOps, the visibility also in operations? Can I see where somebody, something is stuck? Can I understand the logic which is expressed there? And probably does it scale? That depends on what I do there. And if you're using something, something based on BPMN, you're at least through the door with the first three questions. And as a last short pro tip, I give you uh, my recommendation, but that's probably the opinion on, opinionated one as well. So recap, quick walkthrough. Aggregates are consistency boundaries. Design them carefully. Don't violate them, right? Don't use distributed transactions. Use eventual consistency. Get into that kind of thinking. Item potency is super important if you do that. Um, and some of these challenges require state handling. Could be the saga pattern, but could be much simpler, as I tried to show it at least um, in the middle of the talk as well. Um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, let's do a couple of questions. So, thank you, Bernd. We have time for exactly two questions. Okay, so, very good. So we have to keep consistent. Anyone has a question? Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, basically, uh, microservices about separating stuff into boundaries, and yep. you've introduced just one single point of failure. Oh no, I don't. I didn't. Where did I have a single point of failure? Why in your BPM and engine? No, um, not really. I mean, it depends on the um, little which engine you use, probably. Um, but one thing I did where it was a slide. So that's for me. That's important slide. If I have different services they can run their own engine. It's an implementation decision of that service. 
And as soon as you have to keep something stateful, you probably have to keep state in the service. You can like, program that yourself, or you use something with, with, which is there. And then it depends on the product, how resilient probably the workflow engine is. But it's not a single point of failure. That's really important. It's not a central piece of infrastructure. That's what I wouldn't do in a microservice world. We have one, one question more? left. Yes, there is one. I'm not sure if there's another one. So don't worry. Afterwards, this lunch break. And oh yeah, lunch. You can yeah, you also can get in touch with. Ask me ben. anything during the lunch break. That's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, um, this is probably uh, a bit more about the domain-driven yep. design as such. But um, how bad is it? Because in one slide you showed like I have a. I have two different services uh, trying to commit to a single database. Yeah. How bad it is, and uh, where do I draw the line? Uh, so this one. Yeah. From my perspective, this is pretty bad. <laughs> um, I mean, the the thing is, it always depends, like always. I mean, but um, it's definitely not isolated. You have an implicit constraint of running on the same database. If you're if you're splitting that up. Like, for whatever reason, the service B decides, hey, we need an own database. Or we move to the cloud, we use it on our own instance. The application doesn't work anymore because you, you relied on that consistency constraints that database gave you. And it's implicit, so probably nobody knows because all the people left. If you want to do that, it's okay for me, but then make it explicit and say, hey, this is like one consistency boundary, that's one aggregate. You could still, like, technically, depending on the language, that might be still, like, two product, whatever, main dependency, whatever that is. Um, so you can still structure it internally in a, in a good way, but then it should be one microservice, should be one consistency boundary, because then it's at least clear for everybody they rely on that consistency guarantee from the database. In this picture, you don't know, and that's a bad idea. How often, so the question was, how often do you switch database? Yeah, it really depends a lot. But if you look through the life cycle of the application, um, it might happen sooner or later. And it's not only about switching the databases. It's really that you have two different, I mean, microservices, two different autonomous teams working on things that rely on a, on a central database. And that's, that's just not a good idea, I think. It's technically totally doable, and it's kind of as a quick fix, probably acceptable for some time. But you should be aware of the risk. That's kind of a time bomb there, and you should be aware of that. Okay. Awesome. So thank Lunch you time. very much. Thanks, you guys.